Okay, so um, thank you, everyone. Uh, thanks to the organizers for inviting me. So um, my talk will be a little different from what you've all been um, hearing uh, recently. Uh, I'm from the analytical uh, research division of Sanofi Pasteur, so I'm actually going to focus more on just one particular assay um, for a particular product that we were working on. Um, so my title is Affinity and Beyond, Comparison of a Biocore Affinity Assay with a Cell-Based Potency Assay for an Antibacterial Fab Fragment. So a little background. Um, I'm sure you've all heard of Pseudomonas aeruginosa. It's a gram-negative bacterium. It's commonly found just about everywhere, in the soil, in water. Um, more importantly, it's an opportunistic pathogen that causes some very serious infections in compromised individuals. These infections are wide-ranging. They can be in the respiratory tract, they can be in soft tissues, in the GI tract, and a var variety of other uh, systemic infections can ensue. It's also one of the most commonly isolated hospital-acquired pathogens, uh, so it's a nosocomial uh, infections. And uh, of course, like many other uh, bacterial pathogens, antibiotic resistance is an ever-increasing problem. So what makes it particularly nasty um, is that it has certain virulence factors, and I'm sure several of you have probably heard of type 3 secretion systems. And what type 3 secretion systems are, it's something common to several uh, gram-negative pathogens. And essentially, it's a needle-like apparatus that allows the secretion of bacterial toxins or effector proteins from across the bacterial membranes. Here's the inner membrane, outer membrane. And it can uh, secrete these toxins or effector proteins into a host cell, and it disrupts host cell functions. Some of the toxins that Pseudomonas uh, can secrete are listed here, XOS, XOT, XOU, and XOY. And uh, they target a variety of things. In general, they can target uh, Rho and RAC GTPases, and this will disrupt actin cytoskeleton, which can then lead to um, affecting cell uh, movement, phagocytosis, vesicular trafficking, et cetera. XOT also affects the actin cytoskeletons of the host cell. XOU has a phospholipase activity, so it can actually disrupt host cell plasma membrane integrity. And XOY can also um, disrupt uh, intracellular cyclic AMP activity, and as such, again, disrupts uh, cytoskeletal structures. So of note, uh, what we'll focus on today is right at the tip of this secretion needle. Um, as you can see, there's a protein called PCRV. So what PCRV does is that it forms part of a ring-like structure that is right at the tip of the type 3 secretion needle. And this is what uh, facilitates the translocation of these bacterial toxins into the host cell membrane. Um, bacterial strains that lack PCRV, they can't translocate toxins, and therefore they don't affect eukaryotic cells. And various studies um, listed here, among others, have shown that antibodies directed against PCRV can actually block the secretion of toxins. Furthermore, passive immunization with anti-PCRV antibodies protects against lethal doses of pseudomonas using animal airspace installation models, and uh, it reduces lung damage, bacteremia, septic shock, et cetera. So Calabios Pharmaceuticals um, had uh, engineered a human antibody fab fragment against PCRV, and it's sort of depicted at the end of this diagram here. And this fab had demonstrated effective clearance of pulmonary pseudomonas infection in mouse models. They also devised the pegylated version of the fab. And why pegylate? As you can see, there's two 30K peg chains uh, attached to the fab fragment. And what pegylation does is it helps prolong serum half-life to approximately two weeks. It helps reduce immunogenicity. It further reduces protease susceptibility. And because it lacks an FC-mediated um, uh, portion now, there's no glycosylation, it's unlikely to increase inflammation in the lung, and also it further reduces protease susceptibility. Um, from this, there was a collaboration that was established between Sanofi Pasteur and Calabios. Um, and one of the um, uh, initial projects was to sort of compare uh, different manufacturing processes that were transferred from Calabios to Sanofi Pasteur. So specifically, um, one particular assay that needed to be developed was an affinity assay. Um, this affinity assay would be needed to help monitor the consistency of the product as it's being made from different lots, from different storage and stability conditions. 
To do this, uh, we selected the BACOR T100 and T200 systems. And basically, um, most of you have probably heard of BACOR systems. They rely on surface plasma and resonance technology. How that works in a nutshell is basically there's a gold surface chip. You attach a protein target to the chip. In this case, it could be PCRV, for example. When you run uh, through a flow channel, um, a fab fragment or something that will bind to what's already on the chip, what happens is there's a change in the refractive properties of the gold chip so that when you have an instant light shining on it, the um, angle of the reflected light changes and the BACOR system can detect that in real time. And as such, you get a response in a sensogram with binding going up and you can also monitor dissociation events with a response going down. So an overview of the BACOR affinity assay is as such. Um, we had GST tag PCRV that was coupled to a BACOR sensor chip. And then known concentration of FAB, in this case KB001A, was injected over the chip, which allows binding to the target. Then we can have running buffer go over the chip, and this allows for dissociation events to occur, followed by a regeneration of the entire chip surface to remove any remaining bound FAB, and an injection of the next titration of KB001A over the chip. With four titrations per sample, and one repeat injection of one of these titrations to ensure uh, consistency of injection, we basically get sensigrams that are generated uh, from these titration series of our fab. From that, we can use software to determine the affinity of binding, or KD. So uh, our very first preliminary BACOR data is shown here, um, and it gave us some really good indications about the binding characteristics of this fab. We can see that uh, it fit a very good global one-to-one -one interaction. And as you can see, uh, if you recall from um, your undergrad biochemistry, uh, the affinity of binding, or KD, is very low. The smaller the number, the tighter the binding. And as you can see also, there's a very slow off rate uh, as the lines are almost parallel, and it takes a long time for a significant amount of this molecule to come off of PCRV. Moreover, it gave us a first indication that KB001A that's manufactured at two different sites, site A and site B here, for example, have similar binding kinetics and strength. So that was a good indication of consistency of, of production. Um, I mentioned earlier that we're using a GST fusion to PCRV. So we want to assess to make sure that um, we were uh, really seeing specificity in this assay. So what we did was we bound purified GST protein alone to the BACOR chip. And then we ran um, basically KB001A over it, as well as buffer. And what we can see is that regardless of whether you're running um, running buffer or the pegylated fab, we get a very low to no signal response. As a positive control, we ran uh, anti-GST monoclonal antibody over the immobilized GST protein, and we saw a very good binding signal. Therefore, uh, KB001A doesn't bind to the GST protein alone it interacts specifically with the PCRV moiety. We also want to assess mass transport limitation. Um, with BACOR systems and other fluid systems, it's something that uh, is very important to check for. Uh, what MTL is, is basically it's a phenomenon uh, where if the transport of your analyte, in this case our fab, from the bulk flow, because everything's in a fluid, um, in a tube essentially, if this transfer of the fab from this bulk flow to your actual chip surface is slower than the actual binding of your analyte to the chip surface, this can cause, um, this can skew your kinetics results and give you perhaps slower than expected uh, binding kinetics. So this is undesirable for kinetic assays. So one way to test for this using BACOR systems is to um, determine if the binding response that you get of your fab to your target is affected by the flow rate of the assay. If you change the flow rate of the assay, what happens is you can deliver more um, uh, analyte to the chip surface. And if that f uh, binding response doesn't change, no matter what type of flow rate you're using, from 5, 40, all the way up to 70 microliters per minute, if that doesn't change, then you do not have mass transport limitation, which is good. Uh, as you can see, with the various test flow rates uh, selected, um, we basically had a very similar slope of response. So MTL was not a factor in this particular assay. So we decided to continue with assay development. And we looked at different processes. So as you recall, um, Sanofi Pasteur was trying to develop and optimize different um, uh, methods to produce this 
fab. So we change different reducing modes, different pegylation modes, different types of chromatography being applied um, to different batches of the um, naked fab. And what we show here is that despite these different changes, so we have four different conditions here, the affinity results shown here with the KDE are relatively similar amongst all the different um, procedures used here. Um, to ensure that our assay was repeatable, what we did was we did eight uh, independent preparations of uh, the experiment, put in a 96 well format uh, plate and ran it in the BeaCore, and basically uh, we just let the machine go. And despite the long assay runtime, it actually took about 60 hours to run all six samples, uh, all eight samples. So why did it take so long? You have to remember, this molecule binds very tightly, so we had to allow for a really decent dissociation time to really allow the software to model the interaction. And each sample also had those four titrations as well as one repeat injection. So it actually took a long time to run all these. But in the end, despite all this, the percent CV was very low, less than 10% uh, for the KD values obtained. Um, in industry, it's always good to have a backup system. So we actually ran it on two different machines, the T100 and the T200. Now, the machines are relatively similar. There's some slight differences between the two in terms of sensitivity. But overall, what we see is um, above, we have the T200 values here. These are um, our results for affinity KD and on rate and off rate. And the same thing presented for the T100 here. So we had 34 samples processed in the T200 system, 15 samples processed in the T100 system. And for all the parameters of KA, KD, and affinity, we can see that the average values between the T200 and the T100 be core, they overlap within plus or minus one standard deviation. Altogether, if you look at everything, um, this is the cumulative data from two different systems, two different operators, different be core chips, slightly different levels of, of GST PCRV immobilized to the chip. Um, across all parameters, we have percent CVs that are uh, very good, um, all below 15%. Um, we also want to see how stable this molecule is after mu multiple freeze thaws. So aliquots of this fab were subjected to multiple freeze thaw cycles and then run on the BeaCore assay. Uh, so what I'll show here is basically a KB001A reference lot that we um, basically uh, had various freeze thaw cycles imparted upon it up to six freeze thaws. And again, as you can see, um, with the affinity and the on rate and off rate, um, the, the KB001A lot here tested has a similar, um, has a very low CV. Um, in the spirit of reducing animal use, uh, our platform also developed an in vitro cell-based potency assay to help monitor KB001A activity. Um, this assay would of course help replace in vivo mouse testing, would help reduce animal usage then, and align with the general regulatory requirements that are out there now to um, replace animal usage with perhaps cell-based potency um, uh, assays. So the way that this assay works is we have our target cells, eukaryotic cells, and we incubate them with uh, wild-type pseudomonas. Um, of course, the bacteria will uh, mediate the killing of the target cells through their type 3 secretion system. And the cells, which are now compromised, will release lactate dehydrogenase. Um, and as such, they can, this LDH can be detected with a commercially available kit. And from that, you can sort of calculate cytotoxicity. Um, with the addition of KB001A at different concentrations, and you pre-incubate the, the fab with the bacteria, you can either reduce or completely block the amount of PCRV-mediated killing. As such, we get little or reduced or no LDH release, and again, we measure it with the LDH detection kit. By comparing a reference lot with different lots that we produced or different lots that we stressed, we can get a relative potency of those lots relative to a reference. So we ran the two different assays on um, accelerated uh, stressed uh, KB001A. So we ran the BeaCore affinity assay and as well as cell-based potency assay and we compared the results uh, relative to the untreated reference lot. 
Here we did accelerated temperature studies, um, 45 degrees for upwards to eight weeks applied to the KB001A. And we can see the BioCore affinity results here. Um, if you recall, as the number increases, we get a drop in affinity. This is shown here by the uh, relative affinity, relative to the um, uh, reference standard. And um, a similar drop in affinity was also seen with a cell-based potency uh, assay. What uh, we do note, um, which was very interesting, is that the BioCore assay detected a drop um, well before the cell-based potency assay did. Um, so it detected it, in this case, within two weeks of heat stress, whereas after two weeks, um, there was no real uh, difference between um, uh, the zero week and the two weeks stressed based on the cell-based potency assay. Uh, we also tried other stress conditions as well. Um, here we applied uh, hydrogen peroxide stress to the uh, FAB molecule. And again, the BCOR assay detected a drop in KB001A affinity relative to the reference before the cell-based potency assay did. Uh, we also tested uh, photostress um, being applied to the uh, KB001A. And as again, we detect a, quite easily a drop in the photostress. And the data for the cell-based potency assay, we actually do not have available. But we would expect it to be actually uh, very similar in that we do see a drop but perhaps not as soon. So some closing remarks. Um, a BioCore affinity assay uh, for this anti-PCR fab was developed and showed repeatability, intermediate precision, and robustness. The assay is quick to set up, um, and it can sample from a 96 well plate, and is fully automated once the user prepares the required dilutions. The assay could detect changes in the affinity of these different stressed um, PCRV fab fragments. This agreed with the cell-based potency assay results. However, these changes were seen much earlier with the BACOR affinity assay, showing that the former assay, which is the BACOR one, is more sensitive at detecting these changes. And moreover, the assay uh, requires less time to set up and complete compared to the cell-based potency assay. For example, to test four samples by one operator, it'll take about a day where you can get your results, whereas it'll take two entire days uh, for the cell-based potency assay. Um, lastly, some considerations. Um, these results show that certain antibody-based in vitro potency assays can be complemented or possibly even replaced by biosensor-based affinity assays. And moreover, the advantages of biosensor assays include uh, reduced time to perform the assays, reduced animal usage, hence following the three R's principle, which the industry is leaning towards uh, heavily now. That's replacement, reduction, and refinement of your assays to reduce uh, the use of these animals. And finally, reducing the inherent variability and biological hazards that are associated with cell-based potency assays, which rely on culturing cell lines and playing with uh, pathogenic bacteria. So finally, I'd just like to acknowledge um, my colleagues at Sanofi Pasteur in Toronto who helped uh, support this project, as well as um, individuals in Calabiles, as well with technical support uh, offered by Michael Murphy at uh, General Electric. So with that, um, Thank you for your attention, and I'm happy to take any questions.